I'm not sure what to do with this. Do I get the extra time? No. I'm so privileged and honored to be here with you all today, and especially to have my book nominated for the Welcome Book Prize. It's just a, a tremendous um, honor to know that it is reaching people in a way that is meaningful. Uh, so with that said, uh, why write a book called The Vaccine Race? It actually began with another book, the 2010 Welcome Book Prize winner, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I read that book, I could not put it down, I reread it, I reread it again, and it was uppermost in my mind when in 2012 I was scanning the pages of Science Magazine. I was working at the time at Nature, so it was like the competition, you always had to watch out what the competition was doing. And there came in the letters to Science uh, a letter from a man who identified himself as Leonard Hayflick. Whoops. I'm having the same issues. He, he was, at the time, about 84 years old, and his letter essentially said, the Henrietta Lacks cells are getting all the attention, but in 1962, I derived a group of cells from an aborted fetus that were used to make vaccines that have protected hundreds of millions of people. And what's more, I got into a huge fight, an intellectual property fight over the ownership of the cells with the U.S. government in the 1970s, and it raised questions that are still unanswered to this day. And the letter, I just leapt off the page at me, and I said, how has this not been turned into a book? And so I picked up the phone, I called Leonard Hayflick, I said, it, it sounds like there's an untold story here. And at the end of the phone line, he said, is there ever? And at that point, I realized I needed anyway to go to California for other reasons, but he welcomed me with his lovely wife Ruth at his home in Northern California and told me the backstory of what came to be called the vaccine race. And it began at this place, the Wistar Institute of Anatomy and Biology, an independent research institute tucked away on the University of Pennsylvania campus in Philadelphia. In the day, it had become moribund, but the Board of Trustees had hired this fellow in the middle, Hilary Kaprowski, a Polish emigre, an erudite concert pianist with a tremendous, brilliant scientific mind, a polio vaccine pioneer, and he had revived the Wistar by bringing in all the best European biologists and all the cream of the cream. At the time, he also hired someone that he kind of looked down on, Leonard Hayflick, an up-by-the-bootstraps young Philadelphian from the working class who was tremendously bright and tremendously ambitious, but was hired as essentially a household uh, servant at the Wistar. He was to develop the cultures of cells that the brilliant biologists could then use to do their studies. But he was far more ambitious than that, and he made a really important scientific discovery. And it was this, that normal cells grown in the lab after several generations will die, just like you or me. That was utter, utterly outside of conventional scientific wisdom at the time, which said that if, the lab, if lab cells died, it was the scientist's fault. He or she had screwed up, had incubated them at the wrong temperature, had used the wrong culture medium. Hayflick said no. These cells, unless they're cancer cells, which by definition keep living, are in fact mortal. And this was a huge discovery, but he got tremendous blowback. All the leading lights of biology said he was rash and so on. But he was determined, and, and that to put him on the map. He had another purpose for the cells, though, and it had to do with vaccine making. In the day, virus vaccines were sorely lacking. The main Public health victory had been the Salk and Sabin polio vaccines in 1955 and 1960, but vaccines against most other viral diseases were not available, had not been made. Just a, a little reminder from your high school biology what viruses look like. They're essentially genetic material enclosed in a protein coat. When they're on their own, they're inert. They don't eat, sleep, have sex, or do anything else. To get to multiply, they have to invade other cells, animal or human cells, and replicate themselves within the cell by hijacking its machinery. And then they spill out by their thousands or their tens of thousands from the cell. So viruses to multiply have to have cells. In the day, the falcon save and polio vaccines were made in cells from monkey kidneys. Monkeys were imported by the tens of thousands into this country and into the States, slaughtered and their kidneys used to make these, these viral vaccines, particularly polio. But in the course of the 1950s, it became evident that 
these monkey kidney cells harbored silent viruses. No one knew if they were dangerous to humans. It was assumed that they were killed by the formaldehyde that was used to kill uh, the polio vaccine in, during its production, but no one was sure. And then in 1960, a discovery was made by the woman on the left, a great unsung heroine of medical history, in my opinion, named Bernice Eddy. She took some monkey kidney cells from dozens of pairs of monkeys, or dozens of pairs of kidneys from many monkeys, ground them up, and injected the resulting filtrate under the skins of hundreds of laboratory hamsters. 70% of the hamsters developed cancer. Every hamster that developed a cancer died. This was serious business, and it was giving regulators heartache in the early 1960s. They sh kind of shoveled it under the rug. They put out a very quiet press release about it. Only the National Enquirer, that paragon of journalistic integrity, <laughs> actually got the story right and put it on the front page. But by and large, it was ignored. Leonard Hayflick was paying attention. He thought, if only I could get a clean source of cells from a, from a fetus, an aborted fetus, we know the mother is safe and clean, she has no medical history that would indicate otherwise, and we could multiply those fetal cells and use them as a pedigree gold standard vaccine-making line of cells. He had a contact at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and in 1962, a woman I call Mrs. X in the book uh, quietly had an abortion. She was married to a kind of a no-good Mick. He was out of town a lot. He wasn't much help when he was around. He was an alcoholic and she just couldn't face uh, having another child. She already had several small children. It was legal in Sweden to get an abortion in that day, unlike in the United States, but it was not easy. And by the time she found Eva Ernholm, one of the few women in Swedish gynecology in the day, uh, she was four months pregnant. After her abortion, the fetus was taken without her knowledge or consent, dissected at the Karolinska Institute, and its lungs were packed on wet ice and shipped off to Philadelphia, where Hayflick was waiting to receive them. From them, he developed in the summer of 1962 800 vials uh, of, of fetal lung cells, essentially fibroblasts, the, they're a structural producing cell in the body. Uh, they could be used as miniature vaccine factories, he was persuaded. And so 800 vials like that, every vial containing about 3 million cells, for practical purposes, the supply of, of cells he had created was infinite. Because when he froze them, as he did that summer, if you thawed them out, whether it was a year later, 10 years later, 50 years later, they would begin multiplying again. So that was really important. He sent back an emissary, I should add, let me go back one. He sent back an emissary to Mrs. X, a young Swedish physician, who contacted Mrs. X's uh, general practice doctor and ascertained that, in fact, yes, she did not have cancer, she did not have infectious diseases, her family, her other children were healthy, and this served as the sort of paper trail that Hay Hayflick could then present to regulators. Needless to say, it was a rude awakening for Mrs. X when she was approached this way and learned that her fetus had been taken and used with her consent. In 1963, in this country, it became very clear why uh, or what, what a particular vaccine was that was desperately needed and, and was not available, and that was a vaccine against rubella, also known as ger German measles. If you or I get rubella, it's not a big deal. Kids get it, they might have a temperature, they might have a few lymph nodes. By and large, many people don't even know that when they're infected because it's that mild. But if a pregnant woman is infected, particularly in her first trimester, it is devastating on the fetus. The virus infects virtually every fetal organ. And so, oh, there, there are some rubella virus particles, the little black circles moving between two cells. So in 1963 in this country, and a year later when the epidemic arrived in the United States in 1964, you had tens of thousands of babies born profoundly damaged, cataracts, blindness, uh, deafness, heart defects. Many of them had the swollen, uh, rather the shrunken heads that you see on Zika babies, intellectual disability, or combinations of these conditions. And in fact, Stephen Wensler, born near Philadelphia in 1964, was profoundly deaf, virtually blind, and had heart defects. He was just one of thousands and thousands. There was no vaccine. 
Rubella had only just recently been captured in the lab, and there was an outcry, there was a demand. Certainly in the United States, there was tremendous pressure on the National Institutes of Health to get a vaccine and to get it quickly, because rubella came around in cycles about every six years. So in 1964, the clock began ticking toward 1970, and the race to get the vaccine is the, the race at the heart of my book. This is just an example of the fear that was around for women of childbearing age who were advised by public health authorities to stay away from young children in order to not get rubella. That was the best they could offer. You can imagine for a mother of young children how easy that would be while she was pregnant. So, enter Stanley Plotkin, a colleague at the Wistar Institute, age 32, a colleague of Leonard Hayflix. Plotkin had been here at the Great Ormond Street Hospital during the British epidemic of rubella, which came a year earlier. He was doing a pediatric residency, and so he saw the devastation that had been wreaked in this country by the virus. And he came back to the States determined to make a vaccine. You can see lab techniques are a bit different now. Usually you would use not uh, your mouth to suck up what was in that vial, which was in <laughs> fact rubella virus. Plotkin asked Hayflick, hey, can I use your new cells from Mrs. X, effectively, they, they're officially called WI38 cells, to make my vaccine? Hayflick said, by all means. He handed off some of the cells to Plotkin, and Plotkin went ahead and developed a rubella vaccine. Where did he test it? And, and by the way, he developed it by growing it through the cells through many generations in the lab, because as a virus grows in the lab, it gets better at growing in the lab, but less good at causing disease in humans. So this is a live, weakened virus vaccine that he developed. With the permission of the Archbishop of Philadelphia, Plotkin was given carte blanche to enter the St. Vincent's Home for Children, uh, a Catholic orphanage owned and operated by the Archdiocese in southwest Philadelphia. And so one and two-year-old toddlers at the orphanage were uh, the, fer the first uh, human subjects to ever receive the, the rubella vaccine that Plotkin developed. Uh, he was not an outlier. It was common in those days to use institutionalized populations, a very troubling fact that pervades the book. Uh, these babies at the premature infant nursery at the Philadelphia General Hospital, almost entirely an African-American population, were used to test polio vaccine in the late 1950s. Plotkin entered a David and Goliath race to get the vaccine because uh, Merck and all the other big companies saw that this was going to be a huge market and they wanted to get there first. Plotkin was horribly underfunded, but through tremendous persistence and through the intervention of another uh, unsung woman in U.S. history who I don't have time to go into, uh, ended up in 1979, his vaccine uh, replaced the inferior rubella vaccine that was initially approved in 1969. And so whenever a child in, in Virtually any country in the world has the MMR vaccine. The R rubella component is the vaccine that Plotkin developed. Hayflick had been treated by, as a second-class citizen by Kaprowski. He wasn't happy. He found himself a better job at Stanford, and in 1968, he departed in the family sedan with the kids strapped in back, and alongside a liquid nitrogen refrigerator containing every single vial of the WI-38 cells. <laughs> they traveled via the Grand Canyon and the petrified forest to California. <laughs> Hey, Flick really had a mind of his own. Uh, I, can't, I can't go into all the detail, but he got in, let's say, a lot of trouble. He was at the height of his career in, in the mid-1970s when NIH discovered that not only had he taken all the cells, but that he had begun selling them to vaccine manufacturers. They sent their chief investigator of waste, fraud, and abru abuse to investigate him, and I just don't want to give away the whole story because I'm hoping you'll buy the book. I want to just end on this note because Hayflick's cells and Plotkin's determination and the determination of other vaccine manufacturers who used the cells and another British cell line that was developed using Hayflick's method from an aborted fetus here in 1966 have together produced vaccines that have immunized or that have produced vaccine doses of six billion in number. It's just a tremendous life-saving effect that this has had. And this just brings home for me, this was from my medical student days. I did a pediatrics rotation in South Africa. This was the major hospital for blacks in Durban. And we saw kids like this all the time, tremendously compromised by not being vaccinated. They would get measles, it would invade their lungs, and for lack of a 29% shot, they would end up dead as this child had just one day later. So I guess my conclusion is a plug for the importance of vaccines now and always. 
And that's it. Thank you.